What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Let's Machine, back here again for Practical Machinist. Today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be going through some of the forum posts we found that were interesting and giving our take on it. But before we do, make sure you like and subscribe below if you wanna see more videos. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be going through some forum posts we found on the Practical Machinist forum uh, that we thought were interesting and had some good discussion about them and that you know I had some personal opinions on as well and of course guys if you haven't been to the Practical Machinist forum make sure you check it out um, this is just a sampling of some of the excellent conversations that happen there um, there's a lot of good viewpoints one reason I really like it is it's a more long-form uh, method of communication so you know it's not just Instagram comments where it's something really quick um, you can really have a real discussion and you know, see people's thoughts in long form and uh, kind of dig into things a little more. So it's very, very helpful whether you're looking to, you know, get information on a new kind of tool or you're looking to, um, you know, get a question answered. It's really great for a lot of things. So I highly recommend checking it out. The first one, which we're gonna link up here, that we found that was interesting, was something that guys who, of you who have worked on the floor for a long time, I'm sure are gonna identify with. Um, some of you guys who, you know, deal with purchasing agents and engineers, if you're in a case like myself, we'll definitely understand the situation. But I found the discussion about this to be really interesting. So the scenario that was put forward was a guy runs a machine shop. He's been doing this little part out of, I believe it was UHMW or Delrin, for years for this customer. And it's a very simple part. He said it's a 30 second part. I think he said he sells them for 75 cents each. Literally the lathe comes in, parts off this little you know nipple, and then away it goes. There's no finishing, there's no multiple operations. It's a real quick bar fed, fed um, program. The problem was that his customer, they had a new engineer come on. And this guy was described as being fresh out of school, fresh out of engineer school. And this was one of his first projects. And of course, what happened was the engineer decided that they needed to change this one part. And the part needed to be changed for what sounded like a fairly arbitrary reason. Um, something about an o-ring and then adding a chamfer but the problem was as these things start to uh, tend to happen that the new engineer decided to approach it perhaps like a new engineer and decided to put a very very ridiculously tight i believe it was half a thou tolerance on this chamfer now of course being able to measure a, a chamfer to a half thou tolerance with an o-ring and all this that and the other thing it's gonna add time it's gonna add money the guy was saying you know if i actually have to qa these parts this goes from me checking one every 50 because I got some loosey-goosey tolerances to literally having to check every part and it'll take me two minutes with a custom fixture and some custom, custom measuring tools in order to do it. And he was coming on saying, what do I do? Because in these scenarios, as guys who have been in this scenario will know, you don't want to ruffle feathers, you don't want to lose a customer over something so stupid, but you also don't want to lose money. Um, if you quoted something as being 30 seconds and it's now taking two and a half minutes per part, your price point has to go up. And of course, if you're dealing with a company like this where you know, the engineer is probably not the purchasing agent and the engineer is certainly not the management, um, you know, it could result in a situation where you up your price, the person three above the engineer says, this makes no sense, why are we paying this for this part? And they leave. Um, you know, it's a very common situation, but the discussion on it was interesting. Um, as you guys can see if you go on there, the replies people had to this range from basically rub his nose in it, um, give him a invoice for your new fixturing, for your new checking things, basically blow this guy out of the water and say, sure, if this is how you want it, this is how you're gonna get it, and just letting him sit on it. Two, some of the other responses were, well, why don't you have a conversation with him, see what's important, um, you know, why don't you thank him, see what's going on. The response that I found probably be the, would be the most like my own that was there, was perhaps quoting it two ways. So as a illustrative thing for the engineer, you say, cause here's the thing guys, and you know, I'm trying not to jump too ahead in this conversation, but engineers typically are not people who work on the floor. Engineers go to school. I know they usually have a component where they do some PMT stuff, but they're not people who go and spend years learning how parts are made. So I mean, any guys who've dealt with what I call engineer drawings will know, you'll see things like sharp internal corners on the inside of bosses or super tight tolerances everywhere where they don't need to be there because an engineer who doesn't do purchasing doesn't understand that a part with 50 thou tolerances or 5 thou tolerances is gonna be way cheaper and easier to do than a part with five micron tolerances. It's just, there's a disconnect there. 
So the response that I thought would be most like my own was to quote it out two ways. Be gracious, say thank you. Do you know what? This looks like it's something we can do. Um, here's what I say. Here's the part as it was quoted, it was approved, it's working. Here's the part as you have praised, as you've appraised this drawing, because you know, you've got some very tight tolerances. This is what I have to do in order to make that work. What ended up happening was that the, I mean, this would have been my other strategy, so I'm glad this was used as well, that this guy thought of this, is he went and talked to the uh, engineer and said, listen, I see what you're doing here. This looks great. I can do this for sure, but I'm seeing a half thou tolerance on this. I know what this is doing. I think this doesn't need to be as tight. Is it possible that we can loosen out this tolerance to five thou instead? And the engineer ended up coming back to him and saying, do you know what? Thank you very much. I didn't know what I was asking for. Um, no, you're right. This part does not need that tight a tolerance on this aspect of it. And it ended up being a very good situation. Um, what he did was he, you know, built a relationship instead of burning one down to prove a point. It's very easy to be in that mo mode where you say, you don't like the way I'm doing this. Well, too bad. Now this is the price you're paying. Does it feel good? Sure. Will it get you anywhere, guys? No. Um, definitely, guys, in the comments below, I want you to share some of your engineer stories because I feel like we all have a couple of them that can just curl your hair when you hear them for the first time. So share those below. I'm really looking forward to seeing those. The other one we're going to talk about today was another post we found on the Practical Machinist Forum, which we're going to link above. And this one is a bit of an age old machinist debate that I definitely didn't think people felt so strongly about, but it was very interesting to see the conversation. I highly recommend going to take a look because uh, I feel like this was a very good illustration of guys who've been in the trade for years all basically swapping out their opinions on something that seems so simple, but really has a lot of breadth in it. And that is whether to hammer a part in a vice. So basically the guy was saying it was a debate on I, I can't even remember specifically how it started because I read this yesterday. But the aspect of it was, was that somebody was complaining that, I think it was one of their apprentices, was hammering parts down in the vise too hard. Which of course turned into, well, when do you hammer a part down in a vise? What is the purpose of hammering a part down in a vise? And the opinions there ranged from, you should always absolutely beat the part in the vise into the next century uh, to make sure that it is tight if you don't want to break tools to I have never tightened a vice before in my, or I've never hammered a vice before in my life and you shouldn't be a machinist if you do. Um, the reason I wanna talk about this one guys is because first of all, personally my opinion on it, and I agree with some of the guys on there, is that there is a place for hammering vices uh, or hammering parts on vices. First of all, you should never hammer a vice itself. Um, the only reason you should ever debate even hammering a vice is if for some reason you have a really, really old vice where the movable jaw lifts by a lot when you tighten a part in it. And really the only reason you should hammer that jaw down is because you were trying to get that job done before you throw that vice in the trash. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense. But anybody who has used parallels, those of you guys who have only used hard jaws or you have only used soft jaws or something like that, Parallels, when you put them in, you need to make sure the part is down tight on top of them. Otherwise, you are not ensuring that part is flat. Um, if I put part on parallels, you're not 100% sure that that part is actually down unless your parallels are tight on all sides, right? If I hammer a part down and the one parallel is loose, then it's a pretty good indication that either my part is not flat or it is not sitting flat. The remedy for this is not to smash the part until it bends. Um, guys, when I was an apprentice, I literally bent a plate of steel that was quarter inch because I couldn't get it sit flat on the parallels and I beat it until it concaved. And it was a very frustrating lesson, but I'm glad I learned it because it was a dumb move. Um, you do need to tap your parts down. Keyword is tap. There is a very big difference between hammering down on something and using a hammer to tap a part down. Um, some of the guys in there were saying, and I understand this viewpoint, that if you don't hammer the part, the part will not be tight in the vise. And second of all, guys, never hammer on the actual vise handle. Maybe a little tap here and there, but you should be strong enough to just get it tight enough to hold the part. But you should never have to beat a part down to hold it in the vise, because if you're using cutting force that's that high, your program is no good. Your feeds are too high. Or you're using an incorrect method of work holding. Um, if you're having a part that it keeps, or where it keeps kicking the part out of the vise, and you're hammering down on it to try to keep it in the vise, guys, you should be using a fixture, or maybe you should be using toe clamps. Uh, 
Remember, vices are just one method of work holding. They're nice because they're repeatable, they're easy, and they're fast. But if a job is not performing well in a vice, sometimes you gotta bite the bullet, you gotta go build a fixture where you can hold it a little easier or maybe hold it from the top or hold it from the sides in a method that's not going to require it to be hammered down repeatedly, okay? Um, that's all we're gonna have time for today, guys. We went a little longer than I had thought, but we have some more of these coming up. I would highly recommend you guys go check out the Practical Machinist form. Link me, send me in the comments below. Uh, message us on Instagram with posts that you find interesting because I would love to see what you guys are looking at and we would love to talk about them. As always, guys, make sure you like and subscribe below if you want to see more videos. You take care.